What's up? What's up? <laughs> Good, man. How you doing? What's going on, Brock? Thanks for jumping on and doing this with me. Yeah, you bet, man. I'm excited man. to spend some time with you. It's been a while. I know, I know. Hey, for for whatever reason, I thought last second you might be like, oh, I got the kids. I got, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm actually, I'm, I'm up in Calgary, so I'm traveling just on a little work trip, so. Yeah, I thought, I thought you might pull up, pull up some, you're actually not, not at home right now. No, no, no. Oh, okay. What you doing in Calgary? Uh, I, I, I own a percentage ownership of a company called home one. And so, oh, okay. yeah, they do, uh, we do exterior cleaning and, uh, permanent led, uh, light installations. So gotcha. we're, okay. we're a bunch of equipment, uh, came over from China. So it's getting delivered right now. So we had to clear the shop out, make room for it and measure it out. And yeah. Let's get all that work done that's awesome okay sweet so you're you're already going you're already jumping into the stuff so we, we might as well get it started um mm -hmm. brock, brock the main reason i'm doing this is i get a lot of young people that come and ask me about finances they ask me for career advice uh relationship advice leadership they literally ask me every question in the book yeah. about how to go through this journey of life and figure things out and deal with all the hiccups and um, I've known you for, I want to say it's like nine years now, which is yeah, a, a long, long <laughs> time. It's an incredibly long amount, a lot of time. So in, in my circle, you're probably one of the most successful people that I know and have access to. Um, and then you also you're, people. huh? You don't know enough people. <laughs> I, I, I don't know enough people. Uh, that, <laughs> that's what it is. But you're one of the most successful people. Um, and I, I like your style. And I think when I was younger, maybe I didn't like your style. And then over, over time, it kind of like, I, I understood like Bro Brock's not about the flash. He's not about just buying Gucci bags or brand clothing. Like I remember one of the first meetings, I don't know if you remember this, one of the first meetings you walked in and you had like, uh, I think you had a polo on, but you had like shoes and I, th I think your shoes are ripped and you're a multimillionaire at this time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember this. This is in the, in the library in, uh, in, in Surrey. We're doing yeah, a... the, the guys told me I need new shoes yesterday, actually. So, I'm still <laughs> wearing, you know, I guess I'm still wearing old shoes. Yeah. So, some things never change, but, um, yeah, <clears throat> like, uh, you know, you've had obviously an amazing career at Vivint. Uh, you know, I don't know how much in detail we can go with Vivint, but, now you're, you're kind of starting multiple companies or I'm pretty excited to share your story. Uh, where, where did it all start? Like, let's go right to the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I was in, in terms of getting in, introduced to the industry, I was in uh, my second or third year of university. So I just transferred to the, from a college to a university. I was going to be a school teacher and, uh, Ran into a, a guy paying my, actually in the line to pay tuition, I ran into a guy and we had worked prior, actually done door-to-door -door security. And it was like for this like company called King Electric. And it was just like a part-time, you know, in the evenings we do it at school and after school, sorry. And, and uh, you know, we did it for a couple months and then I see him like two years later and, and he was like, man, you're never going to believe it. You know, what did you do? Oh, I did construction and worked for my brother-in-law and, and uh, he's like, I went down to Detroit and I did what we did with King electric. You're never going to believe it. You know? And I made, I made like 40 grand. Um, and he, he, he didn't, he didn't end up, he, he only went the one year paid off his yeah. loans. He, he had graduated as an accountant. And so he had finished, you know, I think he had a semester left and, um, but I got in contact with him and and met you know met his manager. His manager flew up from Utah and and met with me and my brother and my brother in law and and, and then yeah. the whole family shifted down to were you in Detroit your first summer or no so I was North Carolina so okay. I went to uh, Raleigh Durham North Carolina and and we were gonna go and not gonna go and my wife had just graduated from a nursing uh, her nursing. A job and or, or school sorry and and she had a job and she couldn't you know the the lady on the floor told her like hey you're probably not going to get a job if you you know if you quit and leave you've only been here you know four months or five months and so that was our source of income we were living on student loans you know we had a ton of student loan debt um you know we had a we had a, my 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 boy was uh 
10 months, eight months old, nine months old. He turned one or my first son, my rookie year. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a vehicle. Like we, you know, I had a Nissan Sentra. My wife had a Honda Prelude and they both had like 350,000, 400,000 kilometers on it. So it was like a 50 hour drive to, you know, down across country to North Carolina. So it came it was like i remember i was in i was in a big theater uh class i can't remember what class it was i think it was uh a, no it wasn't a physics class anyways i was in this in this class and i got the call from the um from the uh dealership that uh i got approved for this little minivan it was like prob probably like an eight thousand dollar van and i was like i oh, got approved it was like a <laughs> crazy high interest rate and so i called my wife i'm like we're going we're headed to North Carolina. We're doing it. Like we just got approved for this van. And, and that was, that was kind of like, if we can get a reliable vehicle that we can put our kid in, we can actually drive safely um, somewhere. And so that and was, then, yeah, that was my, so my first summer. How, how old were you at this time? Uh, 25. Okay. So you're like a couple years before I, I joined, I joined the industry at 23. 26. Sorry. So I was born in 78 and it was 2014. Yeah, 2004. Sorry, 2004 was 2004. Yeah, so I joined the industry at uh, 23, so a couple years before you, but I wasn't married, and so like I couldn't even imagine like having to like tell your wife and just hey yeah. we're moving, we're doing this, and uh, you know I'd imagine there was a lot of like pushback, maybe not from her, but from like family, friends. Oh yeah, my parents, um, my father-in-law said, hey, you're really sure? Like, is this something that you know you, you think this is very smart? My dad was like, you're crazy, you know, there's they're they're scamming you. Just you know, yeah. parents being protective and you know wanting your kids to make good decisions, right? And this was very foreign to a a rancher and a trucker, right? My father-in-law uh, trucked his whole life, and my dad was a rancher, and you know, had hardly left Alberta, so um, right going to you know across the country to sell something door-to-door -door security we never had security ever my parents still don't lock their doors so um right. it was just a really foreign concept so yeah yeah you had a full-on burning the ships moment <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> okay, i'm doing this <laughs> yeah yeah so so you you go there uh your first summer obviously you, you did well because you're still in the industry or a similar industry yeah, I sold the uh, 115. So the, at that okay. time, I made uh, made 42,000 uh, US bucks, which was pretty good exchange rate, right? So yeah, so like about 60k your first summer. That's that's right around what you made. Yeah, 55. At, at that time, maybe a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. So so you made good good money your first summer. What was it about the job, the industry, the leadership? Like, what made you say, "I'm going to build"? in this industry like when was that moment that light switch moment for you yeah i mean it was driving home after the the whole experience you you, you know like you, i was able to pay off student loan debt that would have taken me 10 years to pay off like i i had a you know it's called you know practicum so i had a, a teaching practicum and I was coaching basketball and I was you know we were driving out on the bus with a and this is this was after my first summer was driving out on the bus with the the co you know my the the coach who was a teacher and he'd taught for he's been teaching 10 years and he's like he's like I just paid off my my last bit of student loan mm -hmm. and I was just like 10 you've been teaching for 10 years and you, you know you know and then that's that's just the reality like you know people like it, it it costs a lot of money to you know pay off debt when you're trying to also you know pay a mortgage and sure. And so, and, and him and his wife both had student loan debt. And so, it, you know, it kind of sank into me, you know, the opportunity, like I was able to pay off, you know, my student loan and my wife's student loan after our second summer, um, right. get a vehicle. I was in a house. My, you know, when I graduated um, was, was student loan debt free, I guess. And so it's, I mean, it, it was, it, it was purely like the financial opportunity at first mm -hmm. that kind of got me into it right so obviously like i think a lot of us like we come from these humble beginnings where you know you know money is like a huge thing in our family like it's huge because we don't have a lot of it i, I mean i kind of similar we didn't grow up with much you know immigrant, immigrant family we're scraping by so <clears throat> once you see it you see the opportunity you're like wow i'm gonna build here so you went from 
you know, obviously you figured it out first couple of years, but then I think like, like door to door has been around for a long time and a lot of people have been in this industry. What's mm -hmm. allowed you to have the success you've had? Cause I can compare probably two or three people within uh, the door to door space that have put in nine years, but have not gotten as much out of it as you. So where do you think your path differed from people that were um, in the industry, but just didn't get what, what you got? Yeah, it's 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 falling in love with 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 leadership, like true leadership and 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 recruiting and you know teaching people how to do what you know how to do, right? Mm -hmm. And just just uh, I I I really really enjoyed you know managing um, the two years that I managed like an actual office was was some of my favorite times. Um, you know, some of the memories we created, the friendships we created, the you know, the opportunities we created with, uh, with a lot of people. Um, yeah. I, 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 I'm still very active in, at, at Vivint and, and I work with people that I've worked with for 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so you just, you learn that relationships are like, you know, your current, you know, your, your reputation is your currency, your, your relationships are the most important thing in any kind of business. You know, that speed of trust, like things, business just happens so much faster when people know they can trust you. And so once you have, you know, that kind of reputation, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to scale business because you just, you just add people to that culture and, and it's uncommon, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's common to find that in business where, you know, people are honest and they do what they say they're going to do. And, um, you know, you actually care about them and, and that's, you know, when people come into that, they, they want to be a part of that and they just keep coming back and coming back and, you know, and so, yeah. It's 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 recruiting and leadership is is why I've you know had the success I've had. Right. So through through your time in this industry in the door to door space, did you ever doubt what you were doing? Were there any moments where you're like, am I doing the right? Am I in this right industry? Am I doing the right job? Should I be doing something else? Do you not have those thoughts? Because I feel yeah. like every after every summer, I was like, am I doing the right thing? Am I building the right way? Like I would ask myself so many questions. Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta realize that that's 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 not an uncommon thing in any industry. It doesn't matter what the career is. Like I, you know, I associate with a lot of uh, you know successful like you know doctors and lawyers and the traditional like you know uh, optometrist. I actually have a really good buddy. It's an optometrist, and and he's I don't know probably 50, twenty years into his career, twenty five even. And uh, I mean, he he's like if he's like joking jokingly but not jokingly if i have to do another eye exam i'm going to slip my wrist he's like i hate being an optometrist like if i was to do it all over again i'd be a dentist and you know and then you talk to dentists and and it's the same thing you know, <laughs> if i have to genuine like you know not you know, there's this fairy tale idea out there that's i think maybe taught in schools that like find what you love and do what you love and 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 it's just going to be this amazing like work experience that you're just you're out there like bettering the world and making all this money and and just doing what you love and yeah I mean at the end of the day like you got to kind of be interested in what you're doing yeah ninety percent of it is um it's it's work and it's mundane and it's not very sexy it's not very fun uh -huh. um, but there's a lot of value in it there's there's value in just working and and people forget that they forget doesn't matter what you're doing what business you're in what profession you choose you know you you can be happy in it as long as you're getting the value out of like putting in a hard day's effort and and getting that return um you know but it's very few people so did i doubt did i doubt you know my career path um yeah and, um, numerous times um numerous times i think i don't know if it was yearly but uh you know, there was, there was definitely crisis, crisis of, you know, moments of crisis, I guess, where you're like, Sessions. I gotta make it, I gotta make it, I gotta make a change, right? Something's gotta yeah. give. Um, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> what, would you say you're like a natural born salesperson? No, I, I'm actually not that great at sales. Um, okay. I, I really am not at it. Uh, I, I worked probably harder than most guys ever had to work. Uh -huh. Like I really, I really knocked more doors. I talked to more people. I put in more hours. Um, you, you, you know, I wasn't a, a gifted, I guess, sales guy. I'm not right. great with words. I have a terrible memory. Like, yeah. I, 
no, I, I can't like, like great sales. A lot of times great salesmen are like, they have like these photographic man, like they can really recall things really, mm-hmm. really fast and they're sharp, you know, in, in, in their recall. I'm like the opposite. I'm just, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, so, so my sales, like my, my acumen, my sales savvy uh, was really just, just brute work. And, right. And, and, and frankly, that's sometimes more important. It's, sure. it's you get really talented guys that, that can't work. Like they can't be consistent. And I mean, you, you know, the famous quote, right. If you're not consistent, you're not existent. Like it's, <laughs> literally is, is is everything and, and my, my cousin's gonna like to hear that he loved that quote by the way <laughs> he texts it to me all the time so if you're not consistent you're not existent <laughs> so but but i think yeah and i think i would have guessed that from the start too like i don't see you as being like this phenomenal sales person but yeah. i think that's like the same reason why maybe you're not a great sales person you're, you're a great leader i think like it's kind of like that double-edged sword, right? You're, you're walking this thin line of being a great salesperson, but being yeah, I mean, a leader I was, means that. I, I, was, I, was, I was proficient, right? Like uh, I was, I was credible. Like you have to be credible in the space. Like you got to, right. you know, know how to sell to manage. Like I, I, you know, my best summer was 220 alarms, right? So, you know, it was a decent, you know, a decent uh, amount of uh, of security at the time. But um, yeah, I was never like top, top, top guy, but um you know, I got guys to come back and, and, and guys that worked with. This, you know. Yeah, it, it cut out, it cut out slightly, but uh, I think, <laughs> I think we should <laughs> cut out the last 10 seconds, but we'll, we'll keep it real. <laughs> Was it me that cut out or you? <laughs> I don't know. My, internet are you in a hotel room no no i'm in the office uh just one of the one of the storage rooms okay rooms but All right, so I think we lost him, but let's see if we can get him back on. Okay, you're you're back on. I don't know. Did you did you sign off and sign back on, or did it just kick you out? I just switched to I just switched to my phone just to see oh, if the it was a little better. So that seems like it's working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good now. Yeah, perfect. Let's uh let's keep it rolling. So, um, <clears throat> I think we talked a little bit about your story, how you got into the industry. Um, let's talk about. Well, I want to focus, like, I like finance, like, I don't know, I'm just interested in it. I think I realized maybe last year to two years that it's all just kind of a game. Like the numbers get bigger, but it's just a game. You're just playing a game that everyone's playing. You're perpetuating that game. But I'm going to ask you a tough question. And it's and it's not tough, because it's a difficult question to answer. It's just divulging, you're divulging information. So in order to just have credibility with the guys that watch this podcast, they're going to ask me like, why should I listen to Brock? Who is Brock? What has he done? So what's your net worth? Uh, 26 million. 26. Yep. Okay. So you're in the, what is that? Eight figure category, multi eight figures. Sure. Dude, you're, you have 26 million. Damn yeah. Brock. Net worth, yeah. yeah. Why don't you upgrade your shoes? What's that? <laughs> I said, why don't you upgrade your shoes? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I, said, I just did the uh, you know, uh, financial statement for our, our commercial lenders. So, yeah, it was was most of your wealth made in the space or outside of the space? Uh, probably half and half. Actually, I mean, uh. I did I did some really good real estate deals back, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And then recently, the last four years, I've, I've done some good real estate stuff. So that's uh that that's been that's been really good. So yeah. probably half, half real estate, half is just from you know, right. from equity and from obviously upfront earnings and just being smart with money. So right. But in order to buy the real estate, you had to have this opportunity, right? You take yeah, money from I mean, this opportunity, no toss it into real estate, and then they both grow together. Yeah, so, there's no chance that you're not without without the op without the door to door. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you need that cash flow vehicle. So, so you're what it like? Do you have kind of like a rule of thumb for personal finance? Like, I can only spend X amount, or are you just always investment first? Are you always thinking business and cash flow and income first, and then the rest of it? Like, how do you balance all that? Um, no, I mean, not really. Like Alex Dunn gave me really, really good advice back when I was on, I think it was on our second or third, you know, Vivint trip. Um, it was on a cruise and I, I can't remember what I made. I probably made 220, 250 grand. And I, I, I asked him, you know, what, 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 what would you do? He's like, well, this is not what all the financial guys will tell you, but, um, you know, I, I would just pay your mortgage off. So get mortgage free and uh, you know, you'll never, you'll never worry. Yeah, never take a mortgage out. If you go get another house, pay for it in cash. Um, you know, so my personal residence is worth $3 million and it's paid for, right? And so that I mean that that alone, you know, adds a lot to your net worth. And so, um, appreciating assets, you know, with with credit, I really don't use a ton of credit. Um, and and frankly, I just don't drive her for you know happiness in life. I guess um, it's fun to have. It's nice to have. Um, mm -hmm. But I I, yeah, I no. just think that a lot of people search for you know financial freedom and for wealth and to be a millionaire for for all the wrong reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And when they do that, they, they never get it, right? Or if they do get it, it doesn't it doesn't serve them anyways. Um, mm -hmm. what, so, what, is the, what is the best part about having money, in your opinion? Ooh. I mean, being able, having the flexibility to, like, help other people. Yeah. yeah I think someone, someone needs help. Um, um, you know, you can just you, you're able to just step in and help them, and it's mm -hmm. those are some of the you know cherished or you know nice some of the greatest moments, I guess, with you know being a millionaire and being able to help others where you would never have been able to do. Um, right. Those those experiences are pretty special. Right. Okay. So so okay. I I mean I think I've given guys that are gonna watch this a pretty good idea of like how to treat your personal finance. Like we're just trying to give guys ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's important for them to know, like uh, what, what kind of a car are you driving right now? Or just what vehicle? I'm driving a, what is it? A 2020 Chev, uh, one ton Duramax. So. Uh, pickup, pickup truck, I think, right? Pickup truck, okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think this was a few years back. You showed up at one of the meetings in like a Ford Focus or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what, what which one it was. It was probably, a, it was probably a rental, but yeah, <laughs> it was a rental. <laughs> it was a rental. Yeah. But no, it's I think like again, what guys see on Instagram and social media is like, you know, they see your. I don't know if you pay attention on social media, but you see Andrew Tate, right? You drive the Bugatti, then you see. Uh, Iman Godsey, another YouTuber who drives, I don't know, some Porsche or some Lamborghini. Then you see Meet Kevin, all these YouTube guys that are coming up that show personal finance. 
and they're all just driving like really excessively nice cars but you know there are i mean their business is social media so people follow that thinking that you know that they're gonna get that so i mean (laughs) i don't know how they got there i don't even know those people i'm not i'm obviously not on social media so right and that's what i try to tell people i'm like they you know whenever you see that in most cases they have something to sell you you have something they're they're trying to get your attention in some way um but also like they have a net well let's say one of those guys they have a net worth of 50 million well they they got that net worth first before they went and bought the nice car yeah but unfortunately yeah, I, mean, I see people yeah. i see people I think here people that are buying really, these cars people really need to understand that like until you are financially well off like you can go make those decisions like if if I mean, I don't own a fancy car, not because I think people that own fancy cars are, are dumb and they wasted their money. Um, it's just, it's timing, right? If, if, if cars were important to me and I mm-hmm. like them um, and I, I have the net worth I have, then I would own a really nice car. I would own a half a million dollar car. But that's mm-hmm. for me, like, and that's my personal interest. I've never been interested in vehicles. Um, right. You know just just not did you did you never did you never feel like you wanted to play along with the whole jones effect did you not feel pressured by society to drive a nice car now that quote unquote you've made it <laughs> not really no, no? <laughs> yeah no. i mean when you're raised with uh you know you're raised with you know humble i guess or you, know, you just 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 different um different standards different principles different things that are important to you um you, you know i don't i, I spend a lot of money mm-hmm. right? money i spend it on family on on trips on experiences on you know kid my kids like it, it just right. doesn't, it doesn't go to that you know to that other stuff that you see the, the basketball court right yeah yeah no, <laughs> yeah no i think that yeah there's a guy on online who calls it the money dial like everyone's got that one thing that they like to splurge on and i think for you it's always been family that's always yeah. been yeah but yeah. you don't spend it until until it's actually until you have it right like it's right you, got, you gotta live on a budget and you probably should live on a budget forever i i don't keep a great budget now um mm. i really don't need to right um yeah for the most part yeah i i don't know i i guess since i've been around the whole you know uh vivid culture that i i don't think i've ever had a budget but like i just knew like 80 percent of my money was being invested in something yeah. like i never had like uh spend x amount of dollars per month like whenever i wanted something i would get it but i just had in my mind it's like 80 percent of this no matter what happens gets invested in something whether it's uh, stocks or real estate whatever it was um so, so, okay. So you, you obviously the family is a big thing for you in terms of personal finance. Like you spend a lot of money uh, on your family experiences. You're not big on cars, clothing, obviously I could tell like, you know, you know, I, I mean, from the time that I'm not, yeah. <laughs> oh, t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> obviously working today too. I do have nicer shirts, but. <laughs> right. So just like having those experiences. And then I, I've always found that like people that actually wanted to grow in the business, you have to spend money in your business. And that, that doesn't mean like just wearing nice clothes. It means like investing in people. Like I think uh, our, you know, our game plan for a couple of years was making sure everyone was paid well. And, you know, so we can keep growing the business together. I, I, I don't know how much flexibility you got on the business side to like control your, um, how the cash flow worked and how residuals work. But uh, I don't know, maybe you want to talk about how like you made sure guys were taken care of, like, because I know you, I'm guessing you did a bunch of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was there was a decent amount of flexibility. I mean, we had a pretty a, a pretty aggressive budget that we could went we could manage. But you know, my my growth strategy was always to you know to grow from within. I didn't want to like go out and acquire teams and and you know not know what I was acquiring in terms of of habits with compliance or expectations. Um, you know, so liking, you know, so we we tried to spend a, a large amount of our you know, our budget on like events and, and, and things that would bring new guys in and then Mm -hmm. grow. And then we just tried to grow with pay scale. So we, Mm -hmm. we didn't believe in doing special deals and, and, and we tried to keep things uniform. Um, You know, I hate the industry for differences. Once you have differences, you got to manage them. So there's no sense Mm -hmm. this 
this guy makes this much money because he knows this guy, but this guy brings the exact same amount of volume and probably better accounts and makes less. Um, right. It's like an atrocity to me. Like, it's just like morally wrong. I, I, I right. hate that. Yeah. So I try, I try to just keep that um, really clean from a pace pace per perspective and just win people over on, you know, culture, relationships, trust, um, you know, because that in, in this industry, it's, in probably any industry it's it's rare right it's rare mm -hmm. to find someone that you you know if if, if he says he's going to pay you they pay you right? right you know lots of stories of guys getting screwed over getting you know left without this or that and um i just was never ever going to be a part of that right yeah i think but we've always strategy for winning you know at, at Viv and, and we did we did quite well right for sure. Cool. So uh, I think, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about personal finance. Let's, let's go into like, uh, I think I want to talk about leadership uh, principles. I think that's, if I was to say, what is Brock known for? And I would say leadership. Leadership is like the first thing that comes to mind. I, I think finance is there. It'd be like third. Um, sales, I, I don't, I've never seen you sell, so I don't know. <laughs> but, but leadership without a doubt. Like that's like the first thing, the amount of transparency you, uh, you operate in. Um, the amount of time you give people, like you can have a rep call you like three layers down and you'll like answer the call and have a, a candid conversation. So talk about like, where did you learn these leadership principles from? Well, it's probably, um, you know, from a spiritual background, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's leadership is like how you treat people. And mm -hmm. so you treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, and, and, you've heard those, you know, sayings, they're almost kiddish, but people don't do it. Yeah. Very few people can treat people the way they want to be treated. They treat them like a number. They treat them a certain way when they, you know, when they can make them money, um, when they need them, they'll treat them a certain way, but when they don't need them, they, they treat them differently. And so right. for me, it was, um, you know, staying grounded in, you know, my faith and my belief in, you know, humanity and people and the purpose of life that when I saw, you know, a XYZ leader that was, you know, that was hurting, um, it was very easy to have empathy for them. It was very easy mm -hmm. to love them. It was very easy to see them for what they could be, not for what they were right there at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that, those are hard things to teach because they're, you know, to me, they're, you know, it's, it's a faith and it's a principle and it's, you know, it's what you believe about people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, so why, why, why do you think it's so hard for people to practice that? Like, I, I, I want to say like, obviously with Vivint, like, cause most of your career was at Vivint, you had leadership that was like supporting what you were doing. Like they were kind of, they had your back, if you know what I mean. So you need people around you that can build a system that you can operate with trust. Because if you, if you don't trust your leadership, you can't do anything. With them. Yeah. yeah. So you had, I guess, like uh, the good fortune of working with people that were also thinking long-term. But I see so many of these businesses that like, they just think like this year or this next pay period. And then they just like, I'm just like, it's so obvious. Yeah. So why, why do people miss that? I don't know. It's a scarcity thing, right? They operate on scarcity where they they feel like um, they're they're not even confident in their own systems, their own business, their own you know what they actually are providing, and so they try to protect it um, so much that uh, I I never I mean it, I've, I'm super competitive. So when guys did leave me, if they ever did leave, I took it personal. Like, hey, this is like this is this is what it what did where did we go wrong in our leadership, right? Um, but I was never scared for mm -hmm. guys. Like I always was very open. Like, Hey, if you're not happy here, like I can't, I'm not just going to pay you more money to stay, like go right. find an opportunity that you can be happy with. This is what we're right. providing. This is what it is. I'm confident in what we're doing. And, yeah. and, you know, and so it was more of a, that growth mindset where it's just like, Hey, there's more, you know, there's, there's abundance out there. There's always, there's always more guys. There's always more reps. There's always more people we can influence. And this is our opportunity. And we're not going to, we're not going to like apologize about it. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not scared that it's not a good opportunity. Are there other ones out there that are just as good, maybe better? Sure. Mm -hmm. right? This one's not amazing. Um, and I, I, I think that 
human nature is always like the grass is always greener, you know, and, and someone else is always doing something better than me. And so they act out of fear. They act out of like pride. They act out of, you know, all, all of those emotions that, that are negative um, when it right. comes to relationships. Right. And, and frankly, it's, 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 um, it's selfishness. I mean, selfishness is the killer of, of humanity. It's, you know, every, we are selfish beings by nature. And, right. and you've got to learn to, you know, put off being selfish. You want to have a happy marriage. You want to have right. a happy relation, business relationship. You can't be selfish. You can't right. think about yourself first. And right. everybody, you know, you, you hear that and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Share, you know, right. yeah. I my two-year-old, the, my five-year-old, the share, right? Yeah. But you get it, you grow up as an adult and you don't know how. Right. Because you don't care about other people, right? And so why is that hard for people to develop um for for me I, all i can all i know is for me it's it's a spiritual thing like i you know i read scriptures i say prayers and i i personally work you know to put off selfishness and i struggle with it like mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. if you're not working on that stuff personally um you just you're just naturally going to be selfish and it's going to carry over into your business relationships and your personal relationships and and it'll kill for sure. so people do operate like that. Right. Right. I, I just think, I guess like my mind is so logical that I think like me doing, taking the short term hits and the sacrifices is actually still me being selfish. Cause I'm thinking like 10 years from now, like I'm going to have an organization and these people could be with me and like, it is long-term selfishness, right? Like it, so to me, that's still, you know, it is still selfish, but it's like, I'm thinking big picture. Yeah. And I, and I found that when I think big picture, um, it kind of encourages me to be more selfless in, in the short term. Yeah, uh, well, that's good. Yeah, perspective is everything, right? Your paradigm and how you see things. I mean, big picture is is so hard to develop um, yeah. in, in life and because we, we, we're we not big picture people. We're in the now. I, I just want now. Right? Yeah. I'm, I'm hungry and I want to eat right now. Right, yeah. All, Right. Yeah. And then in this business situation and I want it solved now and you're wrong and I'm right. Um, right. And so it's really hard to step back and see like, Hey, where, where could this lead? Where could this decision lead in five years or 10 years? Um, right. But you know, what's also, I, I found kind of cool about our business is that um, we're always working with young people. Generally speaking, we're in that 20 to 30 range until they get into like the upper leadership group. And I, and I feel like that for, especially for men is such a, like, it's like the growth years, I think 20 to 30 is like, man, I, like the amount of times you and I've gone back and forth and like, I've been emotional and like, from, like, uh, yeah. like when the whole Canada thing happened and we moved to America and I lost teams and everything was going like chaotic. I remember there was times where I would call you and be like, Brock, like I lost all my teams, seven years building in this company. Like what the, and Braz probably had that. Um, and I don't think we're the only ones. And I think the reason we felt so strongly about it, because like we really gave it a lot. Like we were out there just, we put everything into the into the business and growing. So yeah, I think that's what I've always admired about the industry is that like, yeah, there is that aspect of business, you make money, blah, blah, blah. But it's like 20 to 30 is like, is like the years where you shape people. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what we foundation building it's huge paradigm shifting because you're raised a certain way and then you go experience life and like you develop all these different paradigms and sometimes they can be really bad if you get into a bad culture you know and you see it you know kids leave home and you know and they, they get into a you know a, a gang or, or or a drug culture or alcohol or or or, or a, a business that's dishonest and and they really develop this like you know who they are in those sure. 20s and so it's yeah, it's, it's super, super important to, to have a solid culture, a solid foundation that, you know, can yeah. shape new paradigms for, you know, for, for guys. Yeah. You know what, what sucks for me <clears throat> is that for, you know, every year we have so many people come in, like, I'm sure you've realized this, we've had, we have a lot of turnover in our industry. Mm -hmm. So, but every year we have, you know, 50 people come in and maybe 20 finish and then like 10 will come back next summer. But I just think like, I think all the, 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 whatever, the fruits of the labor and the development, everything this industry has to offer comes like after year two and year three, like every year, I mean, I just felt like my first five years, I learned so much every year. I was like, 
oh my, like I'm just learning so much, like just leadership principles and people and relationships that it's unfortunate the job is as difficult as it is and people can't handle it. But yeah. man, every year I just, the, I, I was making money and it was cool. I was made six figures in my second year, like 150, then 200 something. And I was super exci excited about it. But it was like, I think it attests to what I was learning in those years. And I think all the lessons I learned in those summers, having responsibility, accountability, then translated to my success, like going forward. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I look at it, um, you know, I, I think... I think everybody should try the industry. I think every every twenty year old you know guy girl should give it a go because I I don't think success is determined on whether you sell a lot and make a lot of money. It's 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 your effort. And so if you can put a hundred percent effort in on the doors for four months, you'll learn the same. You know, regardless if you've made like five bucks or five hundred mm -hmm. bucks or you know, you will learn the same about yourself and you'll learn you know the the same skill sets as long as you pick a company that has great culture and, and leaders that have, you know, good leadership principles. And that's, that's the hard part. And so in starting, you know, door to door companies or, or running a partnership, like that was, that was always try. I always tried to make it somehow be the, the focus, which is why I'd go out and present on my, my, you know, my, my pillars of success. Cause there's, I, I felt this need to like, I know that, that half of these guys that are here are not going to come back and I want to give them something, right? I want them to leave and I want them to, and it, it was funny because last night um, I ran into, it was, it was uh, Jordan Martin's dad and uh, he was like, Hey, I ran into somebody that knew you at the UCP, you know, AGM um, meeting. And uh, he was like, telling this story. He's like, he, he was like, ah, I know these Wahlberg, this Wahlberger guy. And, and he, he was like, at Vivint, this company Vivint, and obviously Jordan's dad's like, oh, yeah, I'm very familiar with Vivint. I know, I know the Wahlberg. He's like, oh, you know, you know Luke, yeah, yeah. And oh, I worked in North, uh, I worked in the Newfoundland, you know, my, for for one summer. I wasn't very good. I sold like 20 accounts. Um, but yeah, Brock, like, he he bought me a phone. Like, I didn't I didn't have a phone, and this guy like bought me a phone, and I was like, man, I want to I want to be like that guy. And and one day, and he's like, everything that I've I, he's like, I attribute all of my success in my business to that, those four months in, in Newfoundland. He sold 20 yeah. kids. Like we would look at that and be like, you know, he was a, he was a low performing rep that never came back. You know, we worked mm -hmm. one side for us. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't know his name. I don't, I don't remember, um, you know, this was a long, seven, eight years ago. And right. so, it's, you know, a story, and that's not the story of every, obviously you're not going to touch every person that comes into your program but if you have great culture and and you know you teach great principles you can touch way more people than you think you're touching you can help and influence way more people it's not just the guys that come back for sure know, it's just it's it's everyone that comes into your organization so for sure and even the the like the layered effect of that right you might work with someone for a period but they might have an effect and people see the group success and it affects them kind of all the way through. Why why are you so transparent about your business? People need to hear this one. Yeah. Um I, I I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you where that question I'll tell you really quickly where that question comes from. I've talked to in the last year, I would say, I've talked to like 10 plus business owners. And they never break down the business in detail. And, and it, I, I don't like it because I know it's like they're keeping things from me and I don't want that, especially if, with the experiences I've had, I want to build long-term, yeah. but when we come to you, it's just like, here's my books. What do you want to know? <laughs> yeah. My, I mean, it's one, it's scarcity, right? Like they're, again, they're scared. Someone's going to copy their model or they're, they're scared that, you know, maybe, I, maybe I don't have something special or, you know, they, they want to, they, they, people hold their cards back because they want to feel like, you know, what I've created is like amazing and and it is, but, but then why don't you share it to people? You just open it and share it. And so that I've always operated more on a, on a transparent, um, for, you know, philosophy and, because one, it, it establishes immediate trust, which you mm -hmm. can't, you know, everyone talks about, Oh, oh you, you can't do business without trust. Well, then how do you get people to trust you? Be honest with them and share, you know, share everything with them. Right. Um, right. The, you know, and teach, right? We're, we're a young, young uh, group in the, in this industry. And so you, you, you teach business through helping them understand it. And it was one of the things that I didn't love about Vivint. I, Vivint was not transparent with me. I worked with him for, 
you know, for many years and I still work with them and, you know, they don't open the books. Um, they don't right. share you know, creation costs. Um, they don't share, you know, where the company is. They don't try to, you know, and I wasn't a smart enough kid to like, you know, figure it out myself. Um, mm -hmm. I just was really, you know, I loved people and I worked really hard, um, you know, but we, we built, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of value. And, and I really didn't understand the industry. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think that they could have done a way better job and, and opening up and sharing and helping me. Do you, do you think you would have taken more advantage of it if they were more transparent about it? I mean, other guys would, I wouldn't, I mean, my yeah. nature is not, you know, I don't know. I mean like advantage, not in the sense of like use the company. I meant like, would you have blown the opportunity up bigger if you understood it more? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I always think about that. I always think like the more I understand about the business, the more I'm committed to the business. I just care more. Like, oh, I'm like, I understand how it works. It's very simple. Yeah. And it's, I, I don't know. I, I think in this injury, especially people are scared that like, oh, well, they'll just copy or they'll just leave us and they'll go start their own business. It's like, okay, well, great. Yeah, then, I, then you don't have a great, you don't have a strong enough culture. They don't like you enough. You're not providing enough value to them to, for them to stay. And frankly, I always thought, I always thought that Vivid was so good at being more transparent, primarily because the innovation is not something you can just replicate. Like you can maybe build the culture, you can copy ideologies and leadership principles. But when they started making their own technology, two gig, the new camera, I was like, even if someone leaves, like they're not going to go get Goldman Sachs funding to build their own technology. Right. Yeah. That's why I always felt like Vim was in a good position to do that. Because they're like, they just, they got, they got the Goldman money, the black yeah. money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's cool man dude i i really appreciate um obviously all the years that we worked together because uh it's given me so much knowledge and i realized that once i finished my university degree i was uh, originally studying science i was gonna go down the dental school path and, yeah. and i left that and and came well i came here first made 60k and i was like i'm doing this like i'm going into business yeah. and i and just over the years my passion's just grown for business and like you know these podcasts i'm always looking for ways to like get the edge and like grow as a person, as a leader. Um, so like, yeah, for me, it's like, it is really hard for me to be around people that aren't like going at it. Cause I'm like always wired in. Yeah. Trying to push. I text you at five in the morning and then you send me a message back. Like, you're like, I'm like, what are you doing awake at five? <laughs> yeah. I didn't think you'd be awake that early. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I really appreciate all the years and all the, the lessons that I've learned from you. Um, in, in business it's been like yeah it's just it's crazy like the amount of stuff that I've learned and I don't know I just feel so excited about my day I don't know people see Finn and stuff like I'm up at like six I'm excited about going to work and doing something that day right so um If there's anything you want to talk about for this last little bit, I want to give you a few minutes and then I'll kind of close it off here. Any, yeah. Anything you want to touch on? No, no, I mean, I'm, oh, okay. pretty, I'm pretty open book. You can ask me anything, but no, I don't have a whole. Per perfect. We'll do another one. I always try to do another one a year from now because then we can talk about what's developed in the year. Um, last year, I believe, is when you made the jump with the beta and home one. Yep. That happened. So, uh, I want you to talk about, I want you to talk about that journey. What's the last year been like, the decision to start a company, all that. Talk about all that. It's just been fun. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you, I guess I, I'm in a unique position because it's, my back's not up against the wall. Like I have, uh, you know, I have enough funds or money to live for a long time. And so, you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I, I, I love business. I've always wanted to, you know, start a business and, and create, you know, something. And so it's just been, uh, it's been exciting, you know, and and I, mean, I still I still work for Vivint, still love Vivint, and and very very pro, um, you know, recruit for Vivint, and and uh, you know they're they're an amazing company, and and uh, you know, but this they 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 left Canada. We don't have opportunities for guys in Canada, and you know we have a ton of relationships with with people in Canada from over the years, and so we, it's been fun to you know, to, to go create opportunities for, you know, for those guys and actually own the opportunities, not just like, 
you know, partner with somebody that's already got a business and, you know, provide sales. Like I, I, I love actually starting it from scratch and, you know, doing the operations and the finance and the, you know, and, 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 and the sales, right. It's, 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 it's a little bit scary. I have to be careful because I really love it. And <laughs> I find myself working, you know, more than I need to work. And so, yeah. You know, making sure that I'm still focused on you know, my kids and family. And Isn't that such a great feeling? Just like being so in it and then you get looked up and like five hours have gone by and, you know, I've been working for stuff. Like the time disappears. I think that's a great feeling. Yeah. I'm not like that optometrist that can't, you know, wants to slit his wrists. Like I love getting up and like going. Yeah. Out. It just, yeah. I absolutely love it. It's just fun. I love the guys I work with. Um, you know, and it's just an exciting time to create something. Right. Yeah. And for anyone that's on the edge, what would you tell them on the edge of like starting their own venture? What What's the advice you would give them? Uh, learn to make money day one. You know, learn, don't, don't underestimate like, oh, don't put off like how to make money. Um, make sure you do the unit economics on your business. So if you sell one unit of service or, or product, uh, do the unit economics and, you know, and, and don't underestimate um, how how much work it's going to be and mm -hmm. partner with really talented people, you know, people that are more talented than you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's it, Brock. I think we can wrap it up there for the first call. I'm really, I'm really excited to share this with the guys. I think uh, a lot of nuggets, especially from personal finance to leadership, to transparency, I think there's a lot of stuff that I've kind of learned from you, um, you know, working at Vivint and that I'm excited to share with the guys. So awesome, man. Well, hopefully there's some value. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thanks again, Brock. Appreciate it. Take care. Yeah. See ya.